Hello, everybody. It's very nice to see you. My name is Grace Brooksner. I made a game called Grace Brooksner Presents The Haunted Island, a frog detective game, um, which I assume all of you had, have played and loved um, because it made $17 million. <laughs> Not really. Um, <laughs> so my talk today is about how to build games around humor and write jokes that aren't super generic. Um, so I'm the creative lead of a studio called Worm Club, definitely a real company. Um, and we're in the process of making another Frog Detective game at the moment. So let's get started with some disclaimers. So let's have a disclaimer. <laughs> Um, I can't make your jokes funny. Um, I can give you tools and ideas for how to structure your jokes, but I'm not a magician. Um, I can't turn you into a comedic genius. Some people just aren't funny. That's fine. Um, the other tiny disclaimer with this one is that this talk itself is kind of full of info and isn't exactly funny, like I'm trying to give you as much information as possible. So apologies in advance for the lack of jokes. If you were here for a stand-up routine, I'm really sorry. Um, there's probably like a weird stand-up bar somewhere. Um, but this is a serious talk, so no laughing. What did I just say? Um, okay, so I'm gonna give you a bit of an overview of what I'll be talking about today. Um, I'll start with an introduction to myself, uh, giving some context to this talk and sort of attempting to prove that I know what I'm talking about, which is up for debate. Um, I'll also be going to, into genre subversion and um, how it's an interesting way to onboard your players and signal that your game doesn't necessarily fit in the traditional mold of your chosen genre. Uh, after that, we'll be talking about how to write characters from yourself to make them more authentic and how to make that funny without resorting to offensive stereotypes. And lastly, just some general tips and tricks about how jokes can be structured, a kind of 101 on comedy writing um, for your video games. Alrighty, so a little bit on me. Um, my name is Grace, as we have established. Uh, uh, I guess my most well-known game would be The Haunted Island, which is IGF nominated. Please clap, no don't. <laughs> um, and we're in the process of making um, The Invisible Wizard, which is the second game in the Frog Detective series. Uh, so I guess mostly I'll be talking about the process of writing the Frog Detective games and giving specific examples from those games. Uh, it's also worth mentioning that I've made a pretty big selection of small scale diorama games, which uh, have a bit of a mix of environmental and physical humor and comedy writing. And I learned a lot from those games about how to do uh, visual comedy using an animation and environmental pacing. Uh, yep. So. A little bit more background, which not a lot of people know. Um, I did do stand-up comedy for two years before I got into games. I was living in a small town, so like the comedy scene wasn't huge, but I was getting booked, uh, I guess, a couple of times a month. Um, and I, my, my comedy style wasn't like a traditional sort of comedy. It was uh, absurd and deadpan, kind of like my sense of humor. Uh, but what I learned doing that is that those jokes and that style of comedy is just as funny as traditionally structured jokes. So I'll be uh, referencing my experience with stand-up a little bit as well. Um, a bit of background on The Haunted Island, for those of you who don't know it, weird. Um, I made it in about five months uh, with my team. So. Uh, me, uh, Thomas Bowker, who did the programming and tools, and Dan. My job in the game was to do the assets and the narrative and the dialogue. Um, uh, so Dan was, a, was the composer, and I basically gave him the pitch of like, hey, I want to make Proro, but it's a frog. Can you do music for that? And he was like, hell yeah. That's my impression of Dan. Um, <laughs> so the focus of The Haunted Island was uh, the dialogue and the humour and every interaction that we had in that game had to have some sort of purpose behind it and the biggest purpose of that was just to make people laugh because I feel very strongly about games that are just silly and there for making you feel good because there's a lot of horribleness in the world. Um, the game actually did pretty well considering that it was a very low budget game made in five months. Um, like the whole team was just me and Tom basically. Um, I did all the marketing and stuff. So the, the reception was really positive from both the players and the critics. Um, I'll be going into a little bit of why I think that is a bit later. 
Um, I will mention, however, that some people were pretty confused by it because it's not really a traditional game in any sense. It's maybe more traditional than my previous games, but yeah, it, it's, not, it's not what you expect when you hear detective game. Um, that response didn't really matter too much to me because there's like a myriad of games out there for every type of person and I don't think there's that many games like The Haunted Island, so it's fine. Um, I'll also be showing you, just to give you some background on uh, the style of game and the tone that I was using for the, for the game, I'll show you the intro sequence. So let's have a look a -roo. There we go. Um, that kind of segues kind of nicely into the first topic, which is genre subversion. So let's get started. Um, so I guess beginning with this, you should really think about how most genres that are commonly used for games, they have a lot of cultural baggage and it can be good and bad, but when you find a genre that you want to subvert with the right amount of effort and work into subverting it, you can create something amazing and unexpected. Um, so as an example for From Frog Detective, I took a genre that has a lot of existing expectations. So detective games often have moody, noir tones, like grisly bodies and chase sequences and like cigarettes and all that. Um, and not all of that appeals to me personally, personally as a developer. And I wasn't really seeing the genre subverted in any of the games that I was playing in the way that I would do it. Um, so I kind of found an avenue there that hadn't really been explored to its fullest extent and for me, it's almost always funny to have a genre that fits the setting of your game, but not the tone. Um, and for me, that was like an island with a kind of fake mystery on it. Everything about the setting had to be translatable to noir, but I also knew that the tone was gonna be very lighthearted and gentle. Um, and beginning this process can actually be pretty weird, um, but it's best to start fi by finding your inspirations in the genre that you're looking at, whether that's games or movies or TV shows. So get a feel of the genre so that you know what you're working with. Um, I played a bunch of LA Noir when I was first getting into games and it was one of those first games where I could see the potential for humor in the genre, which kind of doesn't sound exactly what you think of when you think of LA Noir, but there's like this bit in that game where the character will pick up clues and just kind of like wiggle it around in their hands. And to me, that's like really funny. And that was a um, like an inspiration for having, uh, so in the in Frog Detective, there's a magnifying glass that you can just pick up and put to your face and it doesn't actually do anything. It just warps the image, but it's just part of that role playing thing. And it's super goofy because everyone knows that you're, you're not playing frog detective to actually be the frog detective, but it's just an additional role-playing thing. Um, and what I found is that even though it's entirely useless, a bunch of people were using it just to be like, hmm, yes, is this a clue? You know, literally nothing is a clue. <laughs> and so when you're doing your genre-specific research, you've got to find what makes that genre what it is. So those elements that you find that you decide, okay, this is what this genre is, those are the elements that you'll keep and use in your game. And for me, the most recognizable part of the detective genre is the music and the camera angles. So I wanted to take those elements as they were and put them in the game. So every talk sequence in The Haunted Island has camera angles that are copied from TV shows. I had to do like a bunch of research into like camera, cinematography. I just don't care about cinematography, but I wanted it to be like 
as close to that genre as I could. Um, and that kind of amps up the comedy because it's like taking, taking the visuals of it super seriously, even though it's not a very serious game. Um, and another element of the detective genre that I liked was that a lot of detective shows are episodic. So with a new mystery, every episode, think Poirot, think um, Columbo, Sherlock, all those. Um, so for that, I gave the game a theme song at the start and a teaser for the next episode at the end, spoilers. Um, and basically this step is all about making sure that your audience knows what you're subverting. So the players need to recognize what the genre should be so that they know when you're playing with it. So this is where it gets a little bit trickier. It is a bit harder to do, but when you start to actually subvert the genre, that's when it starts to become funny. Um, the best way that I've found to do this is to decide which parts of the genre that you don't like. So in relation to The Haunted Island, one of my biggest pet peeves of the genre is when detectives don't care about their jobs or are like super rude, but they're amazing at solving cases. Like I just want the main character and everything to be super lovely. Um, so in the game, the detective is like super loves being a detective, but isn't necessarily awesome at it. Um, <laughs> um, so the detectives are a bit friendly to everyone and apologetic when, they, when they're suspicious of someone. Um, so already with that, you have a few more, you have a more pleasant character, but there's that silliness there and how the detective interacts with suspects. Um, and a maybe more prominent change was that I made it so that nothing dramatic ever happens in the game. So there's no like, murder um, or grand conspiracies yet. Um, <laughs> but I want to have the story to have an air of mystery without anything sinister actually happening. I also liked the idea of nobody in the island being particularly helpful or like every sort of interaction not really meaning anything apart from just like, oh, I need a magnet if you've got one. Um, so when you subvert genre, make sure that the elements that you subvert aren't the essential elements. Because if I think I had, um, you know, if I had sacrificed the music or the cinematography, the genre wouldn't be recognizable anymore. So it's going back to that step and making sure that the genre you have is being represented properly, even if it's not being represented fully. Um, one thing that I want to bring forward into the development of The Invisible Wizard is managing expectations a little bit better. Um, so I presented The Haunted Island as a detective game, even though like it is a little bit tongue in cheek. Uh, but the problem was there wasn't actually any detective work, any traditional detective work. So people that were picking up The Haunted Island to be a detective were kind of disappointed. Um, it didn't like that doesn't bother me too much, but it was cited in some negative reviews, which as we know can impact the success of your game. So um, with the next game, I'm planning to add more of those traditional investiga investiga investigative yeah, elements um, of detective games into the sequel to um, appease that crowd a little bit more. Um, I think this was like a pretty big lesson for me. Um, and while I wouldn't normally care too much, I think actually leaning into that a little bit more will improve the games. Um, the other thing is like, if you really don't want to include these certain mechanics that are in other games of your genre, you can forego them, but you have to make sure that you signal it in your store page or in your trailers so that the people that aren't into it will stay away or don't because I'm not your dad. Um, <laughs> all right. So I'm going to move on to how I write my characters, which is probably the thing that I thought the most about while doing this because I hadn't actually written um, a game fully before. So it was like, how do I make like 13 people that are not just me every time? <laughs> Cause I, yeah, I find it almost impossible to get myself into the headspace of someone that isn't me or someone that is really far removed from my own lived experience. And I struggled with this a lot because I would 3D model characters and try to develop their personality from their appearance. And it wasn't working because all my characters are just like smiling animals. <laughs> so there wasn't like a whole bunch of personality just in their visuals. Um, so what I did is I developed a system for writing unique and believable characters to help with this. Um, so when you're writing characters, especially characters that are funny, it's really good to draw from what you know, because otherwise you can fall into the trap of making fun of people and traits. Otherwise it can lean into more uh, offensive stuff. 
So if you're writing comedy characters that aren't of your demographic, you need to consult with people from that demographic. Don't make assumptions about how people are because that can turn into stereotyped and offensive characters, especially when you're writing comedy. So if you really want to make a, a game with a diverse cast, especially a comedy game, leave some room in your budget for hiring consultants. Um, and that kind of goes for any narrative game, but I feel like it is quite important for comedy because comedy can offend like pretty easily. Um, yeah. So going into the more specifics of how to write those believable characters, uh, I find the best way is to base them on myself. So for the Haunted Island, I took a look, uh, I took a look at the part of myself, the part of myself that stems, sorry, the parts of my personality that stem from mental illness. And I thought about how to translate those traits onto a character. So writing from what you know is always going to be the most productive way to make characters feel real. Um, so for example, four parts of my personality are that I'm anxious, I'm impatient, I can be pretty shy, and I can also be quite stubborn. Um, and they're not nice traits and they're not attractive traits, but you can write from them. Um, and when I've written down a bunch of personality traits, I assign them each to a character. Um, and then I give each character something that they want or something that they like. And I'll go into detail in this in, more in the next slides, but I think giving them a goal gives them a purpose. So for example, you could have like a super rude character that really wants a boiled egg. And then there's like a character there, that's a character. <laughs> um, and once you have a trait and a purpose or something that the character wants, you can challenge your character. And that's where the dialogue comes in. So in the games, I use the detective as a kind of straight man, but not like a literal straight man, just like a comedy straight man. Um, yeah, the detective relies on logic to solve these problems. So none of the characters in my game are particularly logical. So writing a dialogue between an odd character and a stable character creates some tension and it can be really funny. Um, as long as it comes from your own lived experience, as we have gone over, don't write characters who are mentally ill unless you have experienced that or you have hired a consultant. Don't be messy. I will not tell you again. <laughs> so I'll go into specifics about the characters that I wrote and I'll start with Martin because Martin has probably the most dialogue in the game. Um, and Martin is a really anxious character who just th like really, really wants to feel safe. So what I did with Martin is I looked at what Martin was experiencing and I embodied that character while I was writing him and I tried to figure out what I would do in his situation. So Martin's afraid of a ghost and what I would do in that situation is I would like Google it. I'd be like, is there a ghost? And then every, every positive piece of information that lined up to what I was experiencing, I'd be like, yeah, there is a ghost. So in the game, Martin has all these ghost books and he goes through and reads and he's like, mm, yeah, I haven't seen a ghost yet, so there must be a ghost. Because that's exactly what I would do. Um, yeah, so I have, um, we call it illness anxiety disorder or hypochondria, um, but every time I find a rare illness, I go on Google and I'm like, mm, yeah, I have a headache. <laughs> Yeah, that's Martin. Um, and when I embody a character, I have to think about how to challenge those sorts as well. So the detective, once again, is acting as this straight man that comes in and challenges and dissects each thought that the character has, has and that creates that tension and that dialogue. Um, and that character could fight back, it could dig deeper, it could get offended, or it could start to agree with the detective. And all of those paths are really interesting and could be quite funny. Um, now going on to Mo. Mo is very shy. Um, I'm not the, the most shy person, but I can be quite socially anxious and go into my shell. So with Mo, I picked an animation that really represents their closed off and shy nature. So Mo's kind of like looking down, not really like looking at the detective in the eye. Um, and I think Mo is the character most in the game that embodies the idea of physical comedy because it's pretty funny when you talk to Mo and they just immediately close themselves off even though they were just happily standing there. Um, and comedians use body language quite often to change the mood of a set and physical comedy can absolutely set the tone of a character without any dialogue. So you're immediately going into this idea of how this character is going to be. Um, and Mo was also good to write because I, I sort of became a matchmaker for Mo. Um, if you haven't played the game, Mo has a little bit of a crush on one of the other characters. Uh, so your job is just to go and like, see what 
dance style that character likes the best and come back and tell Mo. And then Mo practices the dance. It's very good. I'm a genius. Um, <laughs> but when you write a character that wants something a little bit embarrassing or a little bit vulnerable, writing the dialogue can be super fun and actually enjoyable to do and that, that comedy kind of writes itself. Um, all right, so let's get into some tips and tricks. These are sort of general bits of advice that don't really neatly fit into the other topics. Um, the first one I'll go into is pacing because often people that are new to writing comedy or new to doing comedy really struggle with pay pacing because they don't give their audience time to breathe after each joke and your players need to laugh. And it is quite difficult to get right. Um, so we weren't using voice acting in our game. It's all text-based. So I was reliant on the text box timings to get the, the, the jokes across. And one trick that I learned was just to use ellipses um, to put uh, beats into your writing. Often when Let's Players are doing it, you can see it really clearly if people are streaming the game because they're reading out the dialogue and you can see where they're pausing to laugh or pausing to let a joke settle in. Um, and it's also when people are reading, they're doing the same thing. So uh, good stand-ups kind of do that as well. So after they pause after making a joke to be like, hey, this is a joke, you should totally laugh now. Um, and it can also be good for adding awkwardness or sort of like ending a non sequitur. Um, but you don't have to use ellipses. You can manufacture this pacing with text box animations or character facial expressions or even camera angles. Um, I think an example of a game that does this really well is Breath of the Wild, because when you're talking to people, they aren't speaking to you, but there's all these different character animations that really sell that comedy. Um, yeah, and you can use these techniques to change the pace as well. So look at games that you find funny and you can just copy their pacing if you're feeling unsure. Um, the other big advice I'd give with pacing is if you're struggling with it, just take a break and leave the dialogue for a while. I do this pretty often when I'm writing because I'm never sure whether a joke is actually landing because I've been looking at it for too long. So uh, leave the dialogue for a while and maybe come back an hour later and play the game and then you'll read it with a new, like with a set of fresh eyes and see whether, you know, the pacing's off or actually the joke is totally fine and you were just like in your head too much. Structure, okay. Um, so when making short games, I'm of the opinion that you should try to stick to one style of humor if you can, just one that works for you. Because when you're doing games, adding a whole bunch of different styles of humor can be a little bit confusing because the player might not know whether, to, whether this is a joke or whether this is like just dialogue. Um, and what I did was with my sense of humor, like I made sure to signal it during the marketing and during the promo work and the people that weren't into that style of humor could stay away because they can see it, they can see it outlined before they, they buy the game. Um, and I think part of the reason that Frog Detective was successful was because I spent a lot of time signaling the humor in the marketing and the trailers. So be very clear about what you're doing. Um, and for bigger games, you can have a mix of different humor styles. Uh, a good talk about that is Zach Johnson's GDC talk about West of Loathing, because um, they obviously made a very big game and they could kind of jam pack jokes into it. Whew. Yeah. So another good tip is structuring jokes that fit with your game style. Um, I don't know if game style is a thing, but we'll just go with it. Um, so my game is explorational, so I structured jokes that could have a payoff regardless of the order that, that the player sees it in. Um, so for example, there is a little note on the notice board, oops, on the notice board um, in the Haunted Island that says, where are my sunglasses? Please give them back. And then you can find a tiny picture of me with sunglasses on, because I have stolen them. And that joke is probably only funny to me, but it's fine. Um, and I guess, yeah, more, more linear games can play with structure a lot more freely. So think of Night in the Woods. Um, I think that's a great example of uh, jokes having a payoff much later on. Because it is a, a larger game, you can pace out those jokes. Um, but with smaller games, like you do want to kind of make it more punchy and, and you don't need callbacks as much, I think. Um, so my last tip and trick is playtesting. <laughs> I'm really sorry. Um, <laughs> so everyone's favorite part of development is playtesting. It's 
sorry. <laughs> Um, so yeah, the one thing that I learned from watching really, really terrible comedians is that a lot of people don't test their jokes out before they go on stage. So treat your dialogue like you're an actually good stand-up comedian and make sure that you workshop it, um, test it out with your players and making, you know, making things that are funny takes work and not every joke will land and that's absolutely fine. Um, with The Haunted Island, I had to go back a lot and change a lot of jokes because not every joke works on every person, um, but I wanted to have as high a success rate as possible. So I was trying to get jokes in there that were more uh, universally funny, which can be a little bit difficult. Um, one tip I'd give you with play testing is that some people are really uncomfortable being vocal when they're playing comedy games, so they don't really want to laugh out loud. Um, so when you're play testing, try and sit in a position where you can gauge their spatial expression. Because I've had silent play tests where the purse, I can't see their face and they're just playing the game for an hour and then they're like, that was good, thank you. And <laughs> I have no idea if they actually liked it. But at the same time, I've had silent play tests where uh, the person, I can see their face and they're smiling or they're quietly giggling and you know that that's good. Um, so if your first play tester doesn't get a joke, that's absolutely fine, just try it on another person. Um, and if there's still no reaction, try and restructure that joke or change the pacing of it and then try it on another person. If it's still not working, just scrap it because it's, it, it's, not, worth to, it's not worth it to disrupt that flow. Um, wow. Uh, yeah, once again, really sorry about this picture. If it, like, it's supposed to be Seinfeld. Uh, uh, <laughs> turns out Seinfeld doesn't have a really iconic body. Um, <laughs> so it just looks like a weird... Anyway, <laughs> all right, talk done. Uh, highlight of GDC, <laughs> thanks for coming. Um, oh, I, yeah, all right, yeah, you can ask me questions if you want. Oh, you've got to go up to the microphones to ask questions. That is something that I forgot to mention. <laughs> Hello. Yes, I'll go first. Hello. Um, so you were talking about, uh, I guess, the length of game. Something I'm noticing with my game right now is that people are just hammering through dialogue a lot. Um, do you have any tips on how to engage people with the dialogue when you have a narrative heavy game? I think that is tricky um, and it is something we struggled with a little bit, especially with younger players who don't want to go through a bunch of like kind of jokes that are too old for them. Um, something that I've been thinking about with this next game is actually to um, have two different dialogue options. So one for people that don't really like reading and just want all the facts with a little bit of joke or um, one dialogue option for everyone that just wants to like go through the game completely. So signaling that at the start of the game, it is like extra work because you basically have to go through and redo the scripts twice. But um, I think for people that don't like reading games, like why are you make playing a narrative game? <laughs> it feels very strange. Um, but yeah, some people don't like reading and I, I don't know if I can save those people, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, hey, um, this is gonna come across as kind of a self-owned, but uh, Good. I think a lot of us feel, at least I think, I hope it's more than just me, that sometimes humor is kind of an intrinsic thing and you're funny or you're not, or your level of humor is set. And for a lot of other things like drawing, it's like, okay, you practice, you get better. So would you say that you can practice humor and jokes and get better at it? And what are some ways to think about doing that if you think that that's a good thing to do? Yeah, I think like some of it is intrinsic, but there's also this thing of like, some people are quite funny, but they don't have the confidence to be funny. Um, so just own everything you say, even if it's not even funny. Like half of the stuff I say isn't funny, but if you pause long enough, people get uncomfortable and they laugh. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, thank you. Um, so the, the talk was super interesting and um, provided that there's a lot of uh, creative direction in building the humor of a game. What would do you in the in the situation you had to grow and, for instance, look for writers to follow your creative direction? Like how you could? It's two parts. Like first, look for the best way uh, of finding people that you think can fit into that kind of creative direction and humor. And what uh, like? 
piece of advice would you give in in the sense of guiding them in a, in a way of of, of um, getting them closer to your humor kind of humor? Yeah, um, it's difficult because I guess I've I've written the whole game myself, um, but I think if basically in any situation where you're working with a narrative consultant or someone that's doing the dialogue, you should just ask them to do a sample, like make sure that they, what they know, like how the, like they know how to write things that are funny. Um, yeah, I guess I, I don't know if I can answer that question fully because it is, it is just me. Um, sometimes you can just tell if you're talking to someone whether your sense of humor is the same as theirs. So that's, yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, hi. Um, you mentioned that uh, when writing a lot of your believable characters, you focus on um, aspects of yourself that could be considered negative traits. Um, I was just wondering how you avoid falling onto um, particularly self-deprecation and jokes of that sort. Yeah, yeah, it is. It, it can be difficult. I think there's there's a delicate balance between uh, making a character who is a really negative part of yourself but I think the biggest thing for me is like having a character who is talking to them be gentle and be kind so it's never like haha you believe that you have a weird disorder haha <laughs> it's like oh like hi you know this doesn't make any sense but when you <laughs> with the detective I'm sort of challenging that character but I'm also doing it in a very kind way to make sure that like the whole game is kind of just about making the characters feel okay about themselves. So when you have those negative personality traits, I think for me it's easier because I know that the character that they're talking to isn't gonna be harsh to them about it. Um, yeah, I guess I'm not a super self-deprecating person either. I think it's just like, believe in yourself. Oh, thank you. All right, so we're about to wrap up. So this will be the last question here, but we do have a wrap up room if you wanna use it later. Hi, uh, on the last topic of testing your dialogue, um, I was just curious, so do you only test after it's in the game or are you ever just testing like written lines? And if you do, do you have like a different approach for that? Um, so I write all my dialogue in the game itself. So every time um, I press play, the dialogue will be in there. I think the best way that I've found to test it is just to ask Tom, who's the programmer and UX designer, to just come over and like read it through and see whether he laughs. Um, yeah, I think when you're testing, it doesn't matter if the game is complete or not, just uh, have enough dialogue in there that it kind of makes sense. Um, I think it is harder to do to do tests when you're when you're just looking at a script rather than yeah. having like something visual to look at. It's kind of harder for your brain to be like, oh, that's, yeah, that's funny, that's a joke. Yeah, so try and get it in there if you can. Thank you. Um, yeah, so we can go to the wrap up room, which is in 2018, I think, if anyone wants to hang out. Otherwise, thank you for coming.